Good afternoon, everybody. It is Heidi Kaizen at Hen and Chick Studio in Conrad, Iowa. And I am in our retreat center again this week for week three of our Box Step Sew Along. And we are so excited to have hundreds of you participating in the Box Step Sew Along. I saw some more people uh, submit their uh, finished tops uh, in the last 24 hours and I've got to get those online. But uh, I can hardly wait to see how many of you get this project done because it is certainly fun and exciting and um, a great way to use your stash. So first of all, if you're saying to yourself, box step so long, what are we talking about? Let me just give you a quick rundown. Um, it is a free pattern, which you're gonna see there on the screen. It looks like it's a dollar, but not to worry. The system doesn't like anything that's zero dollars. But if you um, follow through, type in sold uh, 101 and follow through with that, whichever device you're on, whatever medium you're on, and you uh, end up purchasing it, you're purchasing it for zero dollars. So it's a free downloadable pattern called Box Step. Um, if you download it for free and that's all you do, wonderful, we hope you enjoy the pattern. I also have been doing, um, doing a series of four weeks of four videos. Week one, number one was all about fabric selection. Week number two, cutting. Week number three, which is what we're on today, piecing. Week number four will be finishing. Now, if you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much information, she's throwing out all of these things. Guess what? It is all located. The downloadable pattern, the videos, the schedule, everything that I'm gonna be talking about today is all at henandchickstudio.com slash box step. One word, no space. If you just simply go to our website, the very first screen that pulls up on the home page, there is a and kind of like a, if you want to call it like a little advertisement about box step, just click on that. That's going to take you to the page that has everything that I'm talking about: the downloadable pattern, the videos that we've been doing, the videos that we will do, and as you scroll to the very bottom. I'm starting to upload our customer's version of this particular pattern. And wow, they are as dramatic and different as, uh, what should I say, black and white? Um, it is, um, they, and there's all the gray in between. Um, it is one of those patterns that color placement really plays a part of which pattern you want to see pop out. You can go back to week one's video with the designer, Kate Colleran. And uh, so again, that video is on that page, also on YouTube, all sorts of places. But Kate is, she's such a fun designer and she loves a good block and she loves it when the blocks come together that they create additional patterns. So we talked a lot about in that video about fabric selection, um, about light, medium, and dark kind of thing. Then a blizzard hit, and I did some an additional video where I went a little bit further and said, okay, here's what I learned from Kate, and here's how I'm going to apply that. So there's a second video under there. I recommend that as well. For some people, it really cleared up that light, medium, and dark value and showed how it all went um, together for them, and so certainly recommend that. And so I'm, I'm not gonna talk a lot more about color, um, you know, I'll say today, uh, but want to make sure, bring that to your attention. And even if you're not doing the box step so along, these are lessons that you can use on every single quilt that you're making. And maybe you think, oh, I've already been doing that. Well, you know what? Maybe I say something that just triggers a little aha moment of, I've heard that before, but I hadn't really thought about it. But hey, because I'm working on this project, it now really makes sense. And um, I, I think that's what this, a lot of times what these conversations are 
It's about jogging our memories and keeping things at the forefront that are important, reminding us why we do something. I'm a big advocate of not just telling you to do it, but trying to explain to you why um, you should do it. And I'm gonna go back again. I said I won't talk a lot about the fabric uh, selection, but that's, I think, what I really enjoyed about Kate's conversation with me and was that it wasn't just about put this color here, put this color here, put this color there. It was why are you putting that there and how does that affect then the end result of your quilt? And that's where when you look at the bottom, page, bottom of the box step page, you're going to start to see how um, Deb Gertis's is much more block oriented. Um, Goldie in Virginia's quilt is one spinning wheel and a subtle second block. The minute they saw my finished one, which is laying back here, but is also on that page, um, they said, mom, you can see both pinwheels. And, um, and it's true. It's, it's sort of like, where do you want the pattern to come out? And so it's a great stash busting um, pattern. And uh, I, I, anyway, I'm having a lot of fun with that. And I love to see, um, you know, uh, good afternoon to Jan and Carolyn. Love to see your comments. Um, so by all means, please post in the comments any questions you have um, or any, you know, uh, things that you want to have clarified as we're talking. So today I'm going to be talking about piecing. And piecing really starts with last week's tips about cutting. You gotta be accurate in your cutting or immediately your piecing is off. So, um, you know, one of those things, go back to that cutting diet, cutting um, video if you need to, if, if you're having trouble or need some tips uh, because cutting is so important. And we've done several cutting videos here at Hen and Chick Studio, not just the ones at Box Step um, so along, but uh, it, it, it cutting, there's different tools, there's different reasons um, to cut different ways, and by all means, you want to be as accurate as you possibly can when you're cutting, otherwise the piecing is going to be off um, to begin with, okay? And good morning, Colleen and, um, and Kate, love it, um, and, oh, and Kathy, oh my gosh, we are like coast to coast. We've got Maryland, um, Kathy from Maryland, so way out east, and we've got Kate from Washington, way out west. I love it when we're spreading creativity coast to coast. So thank you ladies for joining me today and filling my heart um, with the fact that we are spreading creativity from coast to coast. So I love that. Okay, so when we start piecing, all right, so let's, we're gonna make the assumption you got your fabrics picked out. We're gonna make the assumption that you got your cutting done and that you're doing good. What is the next single step that you need to take in order to be accurate? Anybody wanna take a guess? Quarter inch seam allowances. And a, a good quarter inch seam allowance really is important um, when we are um, piecing, because again, all of our measurements for cutting are based on that quarter of an inch. So um, I'm putting up a tool, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but let's, let's just talk about some basics, because maybe you're new to quilting and you, you, know, uh, you just got a sewing machine kind of thing. Do you have a quarter inch foot? Um, a quarter inch foot makes it so much easier to know where that quarter of an inch is. And even if your machine does not have one already as part of the machine, you know you can go to a sewing machine company um, business and in most cases, once they know the brand of your machine, the, um, uh, you know, all the details, the you know, kind, all that, then they can get you even if it's a generic quarter foot. So if you think, oh, my machine is old, um, it's not gonna work, um, no, you, you most likely can do that. And you know my big soapbox about sewing machines, no matter what brand you have, I'm not a specific brand oriented person at all. It's all about the education and service. So find yourself a dealer or a, 
um, sewing machine company a business that deals with all brands because once you find that person who does good education and service on your machine, you're gonna get everything you need um, to be able to, to run that machine well, okay? So find that resource for you. Again, whether that's a dealer, a lot of quilt shops, uh, also sell machines, we do not. Um, but uh, I certainly say that if you can find somebody who can service your machine and educate you specifically on your machine, you're going to do a lot better with that. And um, uh, so we want to find, we want to get that perfect quarter inch seam. There are also machines that you can move the needle one way or the other. Okay, so how are you gonna make sure that you are on a quarter of an inch seam? There is this tool that Celine Perkins has designed and you, and you might think, oh, what a, you know, what a simple little tool. It can be worth oodles because if your quarter of an inch is perfect, then you are going to be better off. And she designed this little ruler, and it's also a handy dandy little ruler to have near your sewing machine. Um, with, a, with a perfect quarter of an inch, you have a place to put your needle, then you can um, quickly identify where the quarter of an inch seam is on your machine. You can use masking, uh, masking tape or painter's tape. There's another product, I didn't grab that from downstairs, that has like a little sewing edge. There's a lot of different things that you can add to your sewing machine, um, quarter inch tape from Cluck Cluck Sew. Um, I've used that before. A lot of different things that you could do so that you know exactly where your quarter of an inch is at all times. So definitely want to make sure that you have your quarter of an inch. If you wanna go more in depth into this tool, on our website, over on the Inspire tab, and then down, um, uh, click down, and it's the first one, Learn, uh, learn From Experts, I think is what it says. Um, then you can find Celine Perkins, Perkins Dry Goods, and her quarter inch seam video that she did with us. Wonderful information. So just remember, there's a lot of good resources on our website and that Inspire tab and Meet the Experts or Learn from the Experts is exactly where you would want to go. And great, Kathy, she must have this particular tool because uh, she says it is a great thing. Especially, um, again, we, um, if you get an older machine or you have multiple machines, but the other thing is um, you really do want to use one machine when you are piecing a quilt because that's how different seam allowances can be from machine to machine. And you, it's just so much easier, just like we say, use the same ruler when you're cutting. You can't use the same machine um, so that you don't accidentally um, get a little wider or a little thinner and, and cause things to be off, okay? So quarter inch seam allowance, very, very important. The next thing I would tell you is that if your pieces are cut correctly, then they are gonna become a guide for you when you start piecing. So I have some pieces and parts. Obviously, I got my top, uh, my box step top done over our three-day retreat last week up here in the retreat center. And uh, I, I, the beds are behind me and the work tables are on this other side. I'm standing at the ironing station at the moment. But when you have your pieces and they're all cut, um, you should always, if they are the same size of piece, you should be able to lay one on top of the other and they should perfectly match each other, right? There should be no edges showing um, there it, it, right away. They should automatically match, automatically. And in this particular quilt, there's a lot of two and a half inch squares and you have to match them up. So right away, if you start to see you're hanging over, you're a little shy, something's not right, take a step back, look at your cutting, and see what you could have done different, okay? Fabric can be forgiving. There's a lot of things that we can wing it with, um, but at some point with the amount of um, stitching that's in this and the amount of squares and seams to match, at some point, if you're winging it a little too much, um, everything from the seam allowance to the cutting, you're gonna have a wonky quilt, right? We just can't, there's some things we just can't fix at some point. So when um, I get these two pieces that are matching, a um, uh, couple of things. One, I don't pin. 
not for these two pieces because I am using the pieces themselves as my guide. Now, can you pin? Absolutely, I have no problem with that. But in this very situation, this very situation, I do not for these two. I pinned everything else, right? Now, um, when I go to the sewing machine, I am gonna always start my sewing with a starter strip. And, um, oh, there's end block ends. I'm trying to think of other people call them other things. And if you have a different name, for a starter strip, let me know. But what I do is I take a scrap. So I had some extra squares, right? Wasn't gonna do it. I'll fold it in half so it's double. And then I literally put my this underneath my presser foot, put my needle down, hold my thread so that they don't get sucked into the machine, stitch through the piece, and now that is underneath the presser foot. When I have that there, I always have extras because I have one at the end, one at the beginning, whatever, you know. Um, I'm not wasting thread. I don't get the bird's nest underneath. And then, um, as I'm using two different things here, uh, then when I go to put my two pieces up underneath the presser foot, it automatically, at least on my machine, just starts, I feel like it just transitions. Maybe that's the word. It transitions very well onto that first piece. Because if you ever had it happen where you're trying to sew those two pieces together and that first little section gets kind of bunched up because you're trying to start to sew versus by having a starter strip and then putting that piece up there, it is, it's ready to go. So it's like I can push it through a heck of a lot faster and easier. And oh, a leader. Good job, Carolyn. Thank you. Um, yeah, some people call this a leader. You can get really fancy. Now I will tell you, since I had like 96 of these to do, for box step, I was working on our foundation paper piece project, these really cute chicks. And I was working on that during the blizzard one day, but I had all these cut. So I literally kept the pile of these squares next to my sewing machine. And instead of a oh, scrap piece of fabric, I literally was sewing a second quilt as I was working on my chicks. So um, with paper foundation piecing, there's a lot of start and stop um, just because of the, the nature of that particular project. And so I would then put a couple of these under, then that would be my starter strip. So the next time I came back to the sewing machine with my chick, I would just keep going. I'd cut these off, I'd put them in a pile. Does that make sense? So I was basically sewing two quilts at once. There's even books about projects like that. Um, and starters and stoppers or enders and all that kind of stuff. So leaders and enders, there we go. And thank you, I need help with all of my words. So um, great to have the help. Um, so you get the idea, right? Um, so I start with that leader. Then I, um, when I really get into sewing something like this where I had 96 units, I chain piece. Chain piecing is basically not stopping between pieces to pull up your needle, pull your thread out, trim your thread, um, all of that, right? Instead, I am literally sewing through one piece. I may have to lift my presser foot in order to get the next piece under, but I don't cut the threads. And if you saw the photo I posted yesterday on social media of me holding one of my chains, I had 96 units um, in a very long chain. But then I go back and I snip in between. Now a little tip, if you've got any young children that are fascinated by sewing and you want to intrigue them, have them there with their, even with their kitty scissors and cutting those threads between is a great way to engage um, some excitement for them and have them be a part of that. That's how I started with Goldie and Virginia was that they cut my chains apart and they thought that was um, great. So um, just a little, a little side note there, right? Okay, so um, chain piecing, great way to do it. There's a lot of quilts that don't have 96 units that you could chain piece with, but um, you might have to be a little more creative. You might have to, you might have to think about like, how can I 
how can I chain piece this if I want to sew more at one point? I love um, quilts where I can do um, the piecing and the, the different stages of piecing in different, um, how do I say, different segments because it's, unless a blizzard comes along or I'm at a retreat, I don't get eight hours of sewing time all at once. And um, although I don't mind a blizzard every once in a while, we can't have those every week, right? And I can't go on a retreat every week. I mean, you know, maybe I could, right? Um, and so I like to think of in terms of this morning, I put all these pieces together. It takes me 15, 20 minutes. Tonight, I go to the sewing machine when my brain is half dead from the day and I chain piece and maybe I maybe I cut them apart and pile, pile them up and then tomorrow morning I'm gonna press those so there's there's you know like I can I can do it in a segment that makes sense and feel like I'm accomplishing something if you've seen the the quilt that we've made um, downstairs called day flower it is a wonderful modern pineapple quilt and the blue and gold version called Marlis is the one I made. And, you know, those blocks are big. And there were know, 20 blocks, I think. There's 20 of them. And that was a quilt that I could really accomplish in those kinds of segments. Be and it, it made sense. So I wasn't, I wasn't overwhelmed with the fact that um, I had all these blocks to make and all these big pieces, but instead I'd be like, okay, today I'm going to sew on this strip. That's all, that's all I'm going to do. Tonight, all I'm going to do is press that strip and pin on the next one. Okay. Okay. So, all right. As we talk about pins and, and, um, and piecing things, when do I start to pin? I start to pin the minute I get my pieces just big enough that like, for example, when I had to add this unit to this unit, you bet I'm pinning. Maybe just one pin in the middle if I feel confident. But let's let's face it, fabric shifts, it moves, and I want accuracy, and um, and I don't mind pinning. It doesn't bother me. Um, so again, I would take the two pieces. And oh, Miriam says her granddaughter loves to cut chain pieces apart. Awesome. They do feel like they're really helping. So again, if I'm piecing accurately, have a quarter of an inch seam, and I'm cutting accurately, when I lay these two units down, my ends should be perfectly matching. They should, there should not be any overlap. They should be perfectly laying on top of each other. Again, if they aren't, take a step back and investigate what it is that you're doing different. Could I, if it was too short, um, pull it? Sure. A little bit is one thing, 16th of an inch. But if all of a sudden you find yourself that you're a quarter of an inch off, your quilt's gonna have a different, it's not gonna lay flat, um, even if you are forcing it to be that bigger, you know, that bigger space. And, um, but sometimes also when you put it underneath the sewing machine, okay, uh, have you heard the term baggy bottoms down? Okay, that means that if you have two pieces and let's just say that one piece was baggier, had, had more excess in it, it would be better if you put that baggy side down on the feed dogs, because if you are working with a single feed dog, um, not a dual feed machine, we can I can explain that, but basically those feed dogs grab the fabric a little bit more than on the top of the foot where there's no feed dogs, most machines except for dual feeds, okay? And so if I thought that my piece was just baggy that if I put the baggy bottom down it's gonna ease it up just a little right so you could do that but I would still be pinning then front and back to make sure that I didn't squeeze it in too much 
you know, lose control of that part of it. Um, if you have a dual feed, so if you have feed dogs on the top, and I think FOFs are typically the machines that have the dual feed, you know, dogs. Maybe some of you have a FOF and can tell me that, but I've always, my in my mind, a FOF um, is always the machine that has the dual feed built in. There's probably more now today. Um, if you want to think of it this way, if you put your walking foot on the machine, that makes your machine dual feed because a walking foot is simply feed dogs on the top. And so then you have the feed dogs on the bottom. And so when you have multiple thick layers coming through, multiple, um, those feed dogs bringing it through at the same time can be helpful, okay? All right, so um, am I pinning? I am, yes, I am pinning. Again, one to make sure that I know where I'm at or if I have any excess, I'm using pins. What pins am I using? Well, let me give you my opinion on this. These are absolutely my favorite pins. They are the Patchwork Fine pins. Um, they are, these are $9.50. I am telling you, worth every penny of them. And I'll, I'm gonna show you another picture versus, then we have Quilters pins, um, which are $5.50. 16 cents, it says. I'm not sure if that's quite the right price. $5.69, excuse me. And um, if uh, we use these on the long arm quilting machine because they're thicker, they're longer, they're, you know, whatever. So to show you, and I'm going to see if I can put them in here. One moment. Let's see here if I can, so I can show you appropriately. I'm going to back up off here and see if um, see if I can get it in focus. So on the left, it, with the big yellow head, that is a quilter's pin. Again, that's the one we use for long arming. Um, it is nice and thick and longer. On the right side is a silk head pin or a patchwork fine pin. Ours are from Clover. And um, I think you can clearly see in the picture here, that the patchwork fine pin is literally finer than the quilter's pin. And once you start using a patchwork fine pin and then you go back to a quilter's pin, it's like putting a nail through your fabric. And when we're trying to match things, and I'm gonna show you here in a minute, um, something, when you're trying to match things, having that silk head pin to match it, then you're not, you're not adding a ton of bulk. You're just securing the pieces right where they need to be. And you can get closer to your needle. Never go under your needle with a pin. Don't ever do that. It's gonna ruin your machine. Um, and uh, so just know that that is my absolute favorite pin um, is the Patchwork Fine pin there. I'm gonna put it up again. Love, love that. And so, um, they, but they do bend. So again, take care of them. Um, you know, don't, don't use them in a long arm or going through thick stuff. They'll bend. Absolutely, they'll bend. Um, but they're good. Okay. So when we're pinning, um, I just like to, again, I'm securing. I'm making sure that those pieces are not shifting. So that is important to me. When is, I'm going to say, what is one of the most important things for me to pin is when we're pinning pieces that match. And I'm gonna come again on this side because I think that way I can make sure that you're seeing. So I have two pieces. And in, in this particular quilt, in this particular quilt, we do have to match up some of these. Um, there are different seams. So here, let me get it back, sorry. One moment. Okay, so we want to, can I get it in focus? Let's see, all right, there, all right, there we go. So do you see how when I, and this is the one time saying the word butt is a per perfectly appropriate. You want these seams to butt up to each other. And um, we're going to talk about pressing in just a minute, but this is where I would also pin so that I make sure that those stay facing the other way. Because let me just show you the difference. I think we can, if I did not butt them up, Look at how much thicker that is. So this is so thin and then this is thick. 
And so it just makes for a bigger hump, if you wanna say, in your quilting. And so when I'm pinning, and I'm gonna pin those two together, fine, I lost my pin, there we go. I will literally pin across the seam so that I know that I have locked those two pieces in place. Love that. So that they stay. And it makes, um, I can tell um, there were a couple seams when I was putting rows together that I did not. And I can tell there were a couple seams I didn't quite get, they were quite a little bit off when um, I was putting rows together because I, you know, but for the most part, I feel like the seams match. Um, and again, in a quilt like this, I'll hold it up here for a second so you can see my version, but that the, the squares are lining up with each other. That is the whole goal, okay? Okay, I'll throw that back down here. Um, okay, I'm looking to see if you guys have any uh, specific questions. I think we're doing, I'm, I'm going a little longer than I thought, but I hope, I hope I'm um, giving you some great tips. So uh, if there's, uh, you know, I, again, that's, and if you have to, I always say that these are all recorded. Um, when, when you're on the live shopping page here, it'll be back on that page later tonight. Um, you, so if you want to watch it again, uh, and of course I will upload it to YouTube and it will also live on the box step page. So lots of places if you need to go back and reference the video, can't watch it all at one time. Okay, so I want to talk just a little bit about pressing. That's really the last part of piecing that I think is critical. And uh, first of all, your iron. Does it matter what your iron is, what brand it is? No. It's like driving a car, right? We all have our preferences. Do you like a little iron? Do you like a big iron? Do you have an iron that has a really good flat sole plate, not as many steam holes so that you have a more flat surface or does your iron have a lot of holes in the bottom, making it harder to do like fusible web, that kind of thing? This is a sunbeam. Do you have the Oliso? You know, uh, there, again, there's so many different features. Personal preference, right? Personal preference. But I can tell you one thing. Your iron likes to drink the same water you do. Do not buy distilled water unless your iron specifically tells you to. Because in most cases, that distilled water actually hurts the iron. And so we highly recommend that you just literally go over to the tap and fill it up. We have a little cup here. In fact, it's full of water at the moment. Fill it up with some water. And um, if it, you're drinking it out of the tap, then that's what goes in your iron, okay? And uh, other than that, totally up to you as to what kind of iron. But there is a difference between ironing and pressing. So we iron men's shirts. Dry cleaner does that. And we press quilts. So if you have a brand new piece of fabric and you are ironing it to get the wrinkles out, then you are ironing. You're doing big, wide, wide, uh, you know, movements. That is ironing. That is great when you are doing, again, big things. When you are piecing and you are now pressing, we are not doing the big movements because your fabric has been cut. It could be on the bias. Um, you could stretch pieces. You do not, you know, you could uh, make them, I'll say, uh, wrong shape kind of thing. So we want to be a lot less um, big movement, okay, right? So I don't know. Ironing is like Heidi talking on the TV, like, you know, like I'm wild with my hands. Pressing is holding my hands like I'm in church and I'm trying to be very prim and proper. Okay, hope that helps. Um, so when you are pressing, one of the tips I like is that you set your seams and then you open up your seam to press it. So what does that look like? 
So if I have two pieces together, these pieces are sewn together, I want the piece that I am going to press toward on the top. So I, I'm gonna just say this in, for this particular piece. I want the seam to go toward the light. So I'm gonna have the light piece on the top. Lay it on my ironing board. I will say I'm getting addicted to the wool mats. Um, and so there's a wool mat up in this um, retreat center here. What it's doing is it's giving heat top and bottom and it's just adding to getting a crisper press. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So if you have a wool mat, wonderful, okay? So I put the, the color that I want to press toward on the top. And uh, I do not have a hot iron, so do not worry. I'm not gonna burn anybody or anything like that. So I would take my iron. I love steam. Love it, love it, love it. And so I make sure my iron has full of steam and hot. And I am literally gonna put my iron down on top of the piece that's sewn together but closed. Give it a bit, you know, good little woof of speed, steam. <laughs> Lift it up with my fingers. I am going to open it up and use the tip of my iron to gently, um, I'll say open up the seam. And so I'm gonna come over here, and so I'm gonna say if this is how, I've, this is how I have um, set the seam, now I'm gonna open it up, and I would use the tip of my iron to come along here and to gently, 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 gently open that up. Okay, and I actually think this was pressed the other direction because that's the way it's supposed to go. So, so here, let's just turn it around. So like, this is the way it was pressed. So open it up and then I gently go across that. And once I get, a, feel like I've gone with my tip and made sure that the fabric is going the direction I want it to, I'll come back and I'll put the whole iron on it again, press and maybe steam it if I feel like it or if maybe there's just steam coming out of my machine, okay? Now, another tip about that, when you are working with a mat or, I mean, any kind of a board, once that gets hot, it's actually kind of good to let your piece sit there and, um, and not distort it. That's the word I was looking for earlier. So if I'm doing the same unit over and over, do you see how these end up being kind of stacked like they're a quarter of an inch off? That's because I'm actually using the first piece as my guide for the second piece. So, lay it down, open it up, I've pressed it. Now I take the second piece, so it's in this form, I lay it down, line up the raw edge with the, um, this, come back up here, see if you can see that. See how I've kind of lined it up in that crease? And again, open it up, press it, and you know, steam it. What I'm doing is just giving the ones underneath another good oomph of a press. And so by the time I get done, I could end up with a whole stack. So I'll do six, eight units in a spot. And then usually by then, everything's so hot that I'm like, oh, so I'm gonna move over here. And I take another and I do six or eight units. And then I do maybe another spot. And then I'm like, oh, these are cool. So now I move those over and I start over again. And so that I'm not, I don't do all 96 units on top of each other. That would be way too, way too much. But six, eight units, you'll know, you'll know when it's too much. Um, but I, I feel like I then get even better uh, pressing. Um, I do not, um, turn it over and press from the back. So that's good. And Stan, great, great comment um, is that there is a tool called a, a clapper and there's actually one in the retreat center. And a clapper is typically, um, I think people probably more often use them for garment making because uh, a lot of times when you're working with materials other than 
cotton um, with silk and again the the extra heat and weight all of that uh, plays a part and a clapper is quite often helpful so great tip Stan thanks for adding that in there the other thing that I have not even addressed um, but that is and I was gonna uh, let's see here I think I have a couple a wool mat there just so you can see um, that um, the other product that a lot of people use I do not um, and I don't it's never a it's always a personal choice right because if the technique or the tool works for you then it works for you don't ever judge what you're doing and so Stan likes the clapper awesome and maybe uh, you know Kate who's on here maybe she's gonna say oh I love best press wonderful all of them are good it's you know it's sort of like I'm gonna say driving down the road we can sometimes take 10 different routes to get to the same end result it's exactly and it's it's a personal preference it's what we feel comfortable with but there's a product called um, Ellen's uh, best press and we have it in um, both the 16 ounce and the 32 ounce refillable and um, let's see if I got that one up there and uh, it is a, they refer to it as the clear starch and sizing alternative and I do always purchase the scent free just so you know um, I can get other scents and if that's something that's important to you um, I can work with you on that but I do always do scent free because I do know a lot of people don't like the scent and so I um, stay away from scents because I you know just easier right to be scent free uh, but this is a product that has a, you get a sprayer thing at, downstairs and um, again everybody has their comfort level of how they press if you have um, it refers to one of the things a benefits of this is it says um, two products in one starch and sizing and here's I think where again there's different camps nobody's right or wrong do you pre-wash your fabric or don't pre-wash your fabric if you don't pre-wash your fabric then sizing is still on your fabric that's what makes it just a little bit stiffer if you pre-wash your fabric and all of a sudden you're like wow this fabric is kind of all over there that's because the sizing is gone so I am in the camp that I do not pre-wash that I find it easier to stitch on the machine with the sizing on and then I'll wash it later right some people want to pre-wash and then they then they go back and they put something like this on it to get that sizing okay to get that I'll say firmness um, other people will be like I want to pre-wash my fabric because I'm going to applique it um, needle turn applique well then it's easier to applique it but with the needle turn method if it, the sizing is gone because it's not as stiff right so there's lots of different pieces of information there so I hope I'm not um, giving you too much but that is but best press is again a product that some people really love um, it can be basically spritzed on and when you're pressing and your pieces get nice and crisp so again depends on what fabric you're using depends on the preference you have all of those kinds of things okay and um, steam no steam again personal preference I love steam I just there's something about it I feel maybe it's because I like triggering and have the steam come out and I'm feeling like I'm getting a, a, a spa treatment while I'm while I'm pressing who knows but I do, I do like steam and there's a lot of people who will turn off the steam uh, part on their machines and that's perfectly fine too again what works for you um, to end up with the result that you want is by all means the best okay well I have really taken up some time today but I hope you've gained some type of a tip that will help you piece more perfectly because at the end of the day that's what we're going for whether it be on the box step sew along project or on any project that you're working on now I hope you'll join me next Thursday we'll be back in the morning um, I believe it'll be at 8 30 watch the website and for information but we're going to be talking about finishing quilts 
and I am going to have guests with me, uh, Stephanie Unruh, who works here on Tuesdays, and her mother, Liz Myman, are both professional long arm quilters. And we are going to be talking about quilting and binding and everything about getting your projects done. And I can hardly wait for that. So until next week, I hope you have a great day. I hope you're having fun making box stuff. And I would love it if you would jump on over to the Facebook Creative Community, which is our group for Hen and Chick Studio. Join in the fun, share what you're working on because it is fun to see all of your projects in progress and nobody is behind. The only deadline on this project is February 15th to upload your finished top if you wanna be eligible for prizes. If you're just having fun sewing and enjoying the process, then just keep doing that. But if you want to be eligible for prizes, February 15th is the deadline. Again, everything is at henandchickstudio.com slash box step. So until the next time I see you, have a great day and be creative.